Every individual has his or her own dream of what's ahead. The dreams vary, of course, depending on the individual's age, occupation, ambitions. These three, for example, Bobby Singer, Mary Bryan, John Norton. Bobby's exactly 17 years old. Now that's an age that doesn't look far ahead. He's captain of the team, and he's anxious to make a good showing. Bobby's future looks pretty secure at the moment. John Norton is a lot older than Bobby Singer. As a matter of fact, he'll be 57 next week. John's a realistic, down-to-earth fellow. He knows the future holds no miracles for him, but he doesn't particularly care. John is happy with what he's doing, and all he asks of tomorrow is that it be like today. John Norton's future? Safe and secure, or so it would seem. Mary Bryan is 61, and because of painful arthritis, has had to retire after 25 years of useful employment as a school teacher. This was her past. Is this her future? sitting in the park. A school teacher wants to enjoy a well-earned retirement. An energetic man wants to keep working and active. A young fellow would like very much to win a basketball game. Let's move ahead a few weeks to the day of Bobby Singer's basketball game. Bobby's future was all planned, but he didn't anticipate an automobile accident. Here on the right side to Lindbergh. Lindbergh dribbles left handed once. Almost tied up. Gets rid of the ball to Mel Peterson. Pete now stands at the ball about just high, waiting for his men to pick him up. Gives to Whipple. Whipple out near the 10 second line. Takes the pass into the center. Still holding the ball. Gives to Daubert. Daubert takes the pass to Lindbergh, coming on the back and the give and go. Doesn't do it. Finally to Johnson. For John Norton, the future held something even more serious. He became a victim of stroke. One quick moment of time separated him from the work and activity he thrived on. He sees, he hears, he understands. But his speech centers have been affected and one side of his body is paralyzed. Sitting in the park and painting was, to Mary Bryan, really a compromise, an acceptable substitute for a busy teacher's existence. What she did not anticipate was that the same crippling arthritis which motivated her retirement from teaching might also deprive her of even this simple pleasure. The future for Mary, John, and Bobby looks black. But that seemingly black future is no more definite than was the bright outlook they had before they were struck down. For today, not only these three, but millions of physically handicapped Americans, even those who've been bedridden for years, can be set on the road back to a full and fruitful life. The most important thing they must learn is to help themselves. And who is to teach them this lesson? It might very well be you. You might be Bobby's mother, Mrs. Singer, faced with the challenge of getting a temporarily handicapped teenager back into action. Fortunately, it's a challenge that Mrs. Singer has been trained to face, and Bobby has already started helping himself. No matter how extensive the injury, the patient should be encouraged to do as much for himself as his condition permits. For a parent like Beth Singer, this takes courage. It's often easier and faster to do things for the disabled 
than to stand by and watch. But letting the patient do for himself is always the wisest course. Care in the hospital was the first step on the road back for Bobby. Then, at home, his mother saw to it that his friends pushed him along a little farther. This attention helps the time pass quickly. Now she's ready with another step forward, therapeutic exercise as ordered by the doctor. To speed Bobby's recovery, it is vital now that the full cast has been removed that his muscles be restored to peak efficiency. Muscles atrophy, get weak and flabby from disuse. The only prevention, exercise. This strengthens leg muscles. Exercising lower extremities firms thighs, legs and buttock muscles. The process of self-help contains its own built-in magic. Every step forward automatically opens a wider door to greater and greater accomplishment. Now, just a short time later, Bobby Singer can do far more complicated exercises by himself. And these simple exercises have strengthened his muscles. Surgery and skilled hospital care were only the beginning. It was essential that good physical care and psychological reinforcement were continued at home. Bobby now has the will to win, the desire to return to his own special world, thanks to his mother's home nursing skills. Bobby Singer is on his way back to a full, useful life. A successful self-help program builds on a triple foundation, motivation, exercise, and hope. Hope, an important word. It's easy. It's natural to be hopeful when you're 17. But when you're 61, her doctor prescribed drugs, heat treatments, and exercise. But Mary Bryan does not realize that exercise is often a key to self-help. Actually, exercise had been helping Mary for years, although she didn't know it. Her work as a school teacher involved constant exercise. She bent, stretched, reached, played the piano, moved about. She felt occasional twinges, but she couldn't stop long enough to feel sorry for herself. Her constant activity supplied the exercise that prevented stiffening of joints and shortening of muscles. It kept her going. Once she retired, she weighed and measured her movements against the pain they might involve. A lovely spring day outside, but was it worth the pain it might cost her to walk to the door? It would be fun to model with clay again, but again she considered the pain and the fact that now she could not use her hands as well as she used to. Perhaps a cup of tea. No, she would do without. Until, finally, there came a time when she was scarcely moving at all. And this was the vicious circle. The lack of movement crippled her so much that the very thought of exercise seemed unbearable. Is there any hope for Mary Bryan? There might be. No, I'm not thinking of a new wonder drug, though that's always a possibility. I'm thinking of something uh, closer to home, someone you might know. Perhaps I'm thinking of you. If you were trained in home nursing skills, you'd be equipped to accept the challenge of Mary's problem. You might even be knocking at her door this very moment. You would know that whether the handicap stems from accident, sickness, or old age, the fundamental objective is constant, to restore the patient to self-sufficiency as soon as possible. You could provide Mary with the encouragement she needs so desperately. You could reaffirm her need for exercise.
Perhaps you would start Mary's self-help program by getting her back to the activity that provided her with so much pleasure, modeling with clay and painting. And once you had accomplished this, you would keep encouraging her, expanding her range of activities. Flexibility of joints will return gradually with continuing exercise. Household chores provide excellent exercises if they're started slowly and a bit more is done each day, such as sweeping. Dishwashing. And ironing. Eventually, there would come a day when the results of your efforts would bear fruit. The drug therapy, the heat, and exercise that you suggested will help limber her muscles and joints and help prevent progressive stiffening, shortening, and crippling. Mary Bryan would have been on the road back, and you would have played a substantial part in putting her on that road. Two days ago, John Norden was stricken at home. His right side is paralyzed, his speech centers affected. In stroke, the importance of basic preventive procedures to avoid crippling and the wasting away of good muscle from disuse cannot be overstressed. For even in stroke, practically no victim need become helpless, deformed, or bedridden for the rest of his life if rehabilitation starts immediately. Although Mrs. Norton has taken a home nursing course, she needs to know more about special exercises, needed joint supports, and correct body posture. A public health nurse helps with this continuing process of rehabilitation begun by Mrs. Norton. Following the doctor's orders, she positions John Norton's extremities to prevent muscle shortening. The paralyzed patient must have the affected parts supported because arms and legs tend to turn, causing deformity. Support such as pillows, hand rolls, blankets, towels and sandbags will hold the extremities in proper position. Always try to place the patient in an easy, natural position and provide support wherever it's needed. This will relieve strain on any part of the body and prevent deformities. Keep the body in good alignment. Change the patient's position frequently. Also needed is a footboard higher than the toes. The patient's feet should rest comfortably with toes pointing up. This will prevent shortening of the heel cord or foot drop. Simple procedures like these get the patient off to an excellent start toward rehabilitation. Since a stroke victim may suffer from incontinence, both urinary and bowel, it is important to train the patient to use a bedpan thus helping to keep the skin dry and so avoid the formation of pressure sores. Frequent change of position, bathing, back rubs, and the use of various bed pads, such as easily washed sheepskin with the fleece uppermost, will help keep the patient comfortable and the skin in good condition. Forty-eight hours later, the next phase for John Norton was ordered by the doctor. Exercise, simple range of motion exercises of both the weak and the unaffected extremities keep the joints in hands, arms, legs, feet and hips from getting stiff. They can be carried out efficiently by the home nurse 
after instruction by a professional person. Next, when the patient is well enough, he starts his own exercise. At first, it is difficult, but each day, as strength returns, the task becomes simpler and the horizons wider. Mrs. Norton's home nursing instruction has taught her another important point, to support the patient's emotional needs. She knows the importance of the will to recover, the desire to be independent. The patients need to know that he is still a respected individual. She lets him know that though communication is now slow and difficult, she is still anxious to share his world with him. Several weeks later, we see John Norton using devices that make self-help possible. This pulley and rope, for example, help him to exercise both arms. There are side rails for the bed so that he can turn himself. Two strong household chairs can be an improvised tool to help him regain his lost balance by shifting his weight from one foot to another, over and over again. Yes, John Norton is taking his first step on the tedious road to recovery. Many self-help devices can be bought, borrowed, or rented from manufacturers, rehabilitation centers, and public welfare and other community resources. These devices range from wheelchairs to special clothing without zippers or buttons. There are special forks and spoons, suction cups for dishes, and many others. They're all designed to restore the patient to maximum independence in the shortest possible time. These items can help to get a handicapped patient into and out of a bathtub. And uh, this. A sturdy dining room chair with wheels or casters added to provide mobility. This improvised wheelchair will move and turn easily, and it will fit through a narrow bathroom door. Mrs. Norton knows that a tub bath will give John's morale a boost, and her training as a home nurse has acquainted her with the correct procedures. She places the chair so the patient faces the side of the tub and leaves enough space so that his legs can be raised into the tub. Bracing the chair firmly, she helps the patient lift one leg at a time over the tub. When his legs are inside the tub, she moves the chair close to the tub. The patient utilizes the grab bars to help himself off the chair and onto the edge of the tub. As he works his way onto the stool, Mrs. Norton provides assistance only where it is necessary. He places his feet on the rubber mat. A sling for the weak arm often helps the patient with his balance. For John Norton, there is the joy of once again being able to help himself. For Mrs. Norton, a share in that joy and the pride and satisfaction of knowing how much she has contributed. We've seen how valuable home nursing skills can be in the area of the home, helping friends, neighbors, loved ones. On a broader level, looking toward the unforeseeable future, these skills might someday be a national asset, a reservoir of strength and capability that could help us survive as a nation.
In a community shelter, those with training as home nurses can go about the business of helping the handicapped and the sick back to health as quickly as possible. Even though well on the way to recovery, the stroke victim can become a total invalid unless exercises are continued. The home nurse is aware of this. Had John Norden been a disaster victim, Mrs. Norden could have continued his rehabilitation. As has been said, rehabilitation considers not what is lost, but what is left and tries to make the most of it. We don't know whether we'll ever face a national emergency, but we can predict the future for John Norden. For John Norden, work of a less demanding nature, but still providing the satisfaction of a useful existence. And for Bobby Singer, a gradual return to his active life. For Mary Bryan, a world enlarged rather than diminished. It can be done with a little patience, common sense, and the knowledge that comes with home nursing skills. John Norton, Bobby Singer, Mary Bryan, and millions of others can find the road back. The next film in this home nursing series will deal with that invaluable commodity, water. We'll learn how it relates to cleanliness and health, and how the home nurse can make a little of it go a long way. In the meantime, we'd like to refer you to this Red Cross home nursing textbook. It's available at bookstores and at Red Cross chapters. It contains much of the material covered in this series in more detail it's a good reference book to have in the home.